We're going to be discussing the Aurora Alien Encounter and the UFO crash of 1897. My name is Daniel Allen Jones and I manage a network called Vortexes. I'm interested in a number of different fields of study and topics and subjects, not just aliens and UFOs, but as I was mentioning, anywhere from the paranormal and, and supernatural to the metaphysical, the spiritual, and everything in between. To me, it's all fascinating. I think it's great to see how a lot of these subjects are interconnected and that how it brings a lot of people from these circles together. Well, when we're dealing with the nature of what we're actually seeing, when we're talking about UFOs, this can be something anywhere people describe from small orbs of light to large metallic mile-long craft and anything and everything in between. There's no definitive, it's only one spaceship type of thing that people are seeing all over the world. There's so many types of things that people are experiencing, so we have to really do what we can as researchers to discriminate what it is that people are experiencing, witnessing, or our own experiences in a way that's logical, practical, and then can be verified through repeatable means through science and things of that nature. So there are a lot of different nomenclature that are going around for certain types of UFOs like the TR-3B flying triangle and even things like the Aurora. Has anyone heard of the, this, these supersonic, super secret programs and even maybe heard of the name Aurora mentioned before outside of the, the name of the, the town? It's something that has been going around in UFO circles and the sort where this is a sort of name that seems to be given to maybe a secret project. And it makes us wonder about the origins of such a name and maybe where it had come from. And so this particular design was made by a friend of mine, Monty Earwood, who brought it to a conference and it's really neat to be able to, to have things like that to show to people. And that brings us into the real Aurora, which is a legendary western town. And this is where we really are going to get into the bulk of our talk today. It's great to just be considerate of all the incredible things here in Texas and that all the things that you can go see. And on the subject of UFOs and aliens and mysterious phenomenon, we come to Aurora. And for those who aren't familiar, Aurora is about 20 minutes or so northwest of Fort Worth and it's a small little place, here it is again, a little bit closer, where you have a UFO crash in 1897 where the pilot of said UFO was buried in the local cemetery not even a mile away. So you have a really close proximity of this incident and we'll get into the information as we go along. There's a historical plaque which is erected in 1976 which says that you know, the legend of the spaceship crashed nearby in 1897 and the pilot was killed and buried in the local cemetery. So there is a historical marker that does say this. It's kind of neat. You can go take a picture next to it. Here's an artistic rendition of the original incident. And as it goes, coming down from the south, there was a large metallic cigar-shaped object that was in distress, sputtering, maybe smoking, coming down and crashed into a windmill and exploded, leaving debris all over the place and even remains of what was described to be a body. It was published in the Dallas Morning News where it does talk about the pilot who is not an inhabitant of this world was given a proper Christian burial at the Aurora Cemetery. So that's kind of interesting to really mention that in the newspaper. I will say quickly though that this newspaper is full of airship reports from all over the state not just Aurora, but this was a big phenomenon. And we'll get into that here in a moment. It also said that it collided with the tower of Judge Proctor's windmill and went to pieces with a terrific explosion. So it scattered debris all over the place. And this was a big deal. I think it would have been noticeable by a lot of people either audibly or visibly for well over a mile. So we're going to examine the crash site. The crash site was about right here and you can see that the terrain is a little bit different than the greenery around it. And as a researcher, you have to be careful to see if this is correlative to maybe something that happened. You know, is this result of the crash that happened and maybe something from the, a contaminant changed the terrain? Or is this just a non-associative trait that you 
can look at and say, it's interesting, but it doesn't mean that it happened because of a crash. So you have to look at those kinds of things intricately as a researcher. You don't want to just find things that sound nice and you can just associate because you want it to work. You need to find things that make sense. And so this is a quality that we wonder about. Was this a product of the crash? Maybe so. If uh, you look a bit closer, this is uh, where the windmill would have stood or what was described as a tower, windless, something to that effect, connected to a water mill where the well was. The well was right here. It's now covered up, but it was all one construct. And when it crashed in, it just destroyed everything, leaving debris everywhere. And we're going to play this quick clip from the History Channel so you guys can get an idea about how it worked. 1897, the Dallas Morning News reported about six o'clock this morning, the early risers of Aurora were astonished at the sudden appearance of the airship which has been sailing through the country. It was traveling due north and much nearer the earth than ever before. It sailed directly over the public square and when it reached the north part of town, collided with the tower of Judge Proctor's windmill and went into pieces with a terrific explosion. scattering debris over several acres of ground, wrecking the windmill and water tank, and destroying the judge's flower garden. According to the local legend, many of Aurora's residents raced to Judge J.S. Proctor's farm to help in any way they could. What they found was beyond comprehension. All right, so what did they find? Well, this is the big mystery. You know, there are a lot of ideas about what kind of airships balloons, dirigibles, things like that would have been around at the time and actively in use. And it doesn't seem like there would have been much. Here's some information about what was around at that time. Just small vehicles that were just being put into production. And even a year or so after, you still don't have what was described in the Aurora incident, such as a motorcycle engine with propellers and things like that. This doesn't really seem to fit what we're under the impression of with the description of the Aurora crash. So when we're dealing with the airship mystery of 1897, there are some parts to this mystery that we can see might be associative, like the alleged Sonora Aero Club or these projects like NIMSA and the works of Charles Del Chau, which describe working airships throughout the 1800s. It's still quite a mystery, but we can see that there was definitely a hysteria going on around this time where people would describe seeing pilots and uh, different objects that had wings and propellers. And historians even talked about how they were mentioned in the newspapers and that maybe some of them were hoaxes, but there were a lot of sightings. There was a lot of publications. We need to see how much of these sightings were credible and then maybe discount the ones which were just written for the sake of trying to get ratings and uh, things like that. So the airships seem to have been sighted all over the Northwest. And I don't think that it was one with a trajectory that just came down and crashed in Aurora. I think that there were a number of sightings. And so you have to look at the time frame in which the science fiction was coming into uh, you know, the emerging society and how that might have influenced people in that time frame and how it could have uh, been incorporated into some of these accounts. And so the Wright brothers didn't even come out with their plane until six years later. Fast forwarding through time, you have people like Mary Evans who says the pilot was torn up and killed in the crash and the people of the town who gathered his remains said he was a small man. So that's an interesting claim from an eyewitness. Also, you have someone who says, uh, Charlie Stevens who says that he saw it out in the field where he was doing chores with his father. He saw it fly over and then heard it crash. He wanted to go see what it was, but his father said, no, we need to finish the chores. So that seems like maybe a realistic account. We'll see how that might come into effect. People say the metal weighed several tons and that that would have been a lot of debris to do something with. So. Regarding the metal, it seems like people came and collected it and maybe threw a lot of it into the well or had it hauled off. So we don't really know where a lot of it is today, but we might have some ideas about what happened to it and how it affected people. The Oates family moved into the property uh, on a house on that property where the UFO crashed 
and they wanted to use the well. Brawley Oates wanted to use the well for drinking, so he cleaned up all the debris, and who knows what happened to it, but he drank from that well with his family for a number of years, maybe a little over a decade, to which he later came to realize that he says over maybe 2,000 people have come to inspect the site, and that's how he became familiar with the whole incident. And so he says that it seems like the ground's radioactive and there might be something to it. And then this is also interesting because he acquired really bad maladies on his hands, which he attributed to the well water he drank, saying that it was radioactive and contaminated because of the alien and the UFO crash. People have come and said, I have pieces of metal like Mr. Robert Brown, who has a medallion seeming to come from the crash. And that's kind of interesting. There have been some studies done to show that there's a lot of interesting qualities of this, the metallic alloys and that it's not uh, really magnetic and that's interesting. So different work that's been done. I'm gonna play this quick clip that Jim Mars put together about some witnesses that he got to connect with. But while the old timers around Aurora were hesitant to talk about the spaceship crash, their descendants were not so closed mouth. I've talked to many people in Wise County who will quietly say, oh yes, I've heard about this for years through the family or whatever, and I've even gotten some to speak for the camera. Well, I grew up around here, and I, we moved out here in the late 50s, and I've been here for a long time. And When I was a kid, we used to go up and play up around Aurora, some friends of mine, there's the ballpark up there and some other areas, we used to go out and play around there, and there's some older men that talked about where an old spaceship had crashed. Some people believe it happened. Some of the older ones you talked to would say, well, yeah, but, you know, there really wasn't anything that, that really did happen. And then some of the younger ones that will tell you that, well, yeah, something did happen. My father was there, my grandfather was there, and saw the wreckage or saw what was a wreckage of something. Um, all of them got little pieces of metal at one time, and it's, it's different. It's a, you know, it's a little alloy-looking metal that's soft to the touch, but nobody can explain what it is. We well, we all grew up, well, I grew up in, in Wise County over there by Aurora, the old cemetery over there. And my grandpa, actually it was my great-grandpa, my grandpa was just a young boy back then, I guess. And he said it was around dusk or about dark, and back then there wasn't, you know, any kind of air traffic or anything like that, you know. But he said that there was just a real big, just a boom, you know, a, it, so, something hit the ground, mm -hmm. you know, pretty hard. Uh, they got Joe Smith, that was my great-grandpa, and he, he loaded up all the kids and stuff, because like a circus coming to town, you know, they didn't know what it was. So they all loaded up and they went down the road there, and uh, other guys, other people were out gathering around too, because they actually seen whatever it was, you know, hit when it hit. And it mowed over some trees and everything right there by the cemetery. And as far as what he said he saw was just a bunch of debris. Within, I think he said within, oh, just maybe a matter of four or five hours that uh, every law enforcement agency that was around, this, this neck of the woods up here was there. Real quick, like. <laughs> All right, so some interesting accounts back in 2002 about what happened to the metal and things that had to be done in order to locate it. And so another interesting note is that there may have been hieroglyphics on the metal. And while this is not a picture of any of the Aurora metal, this is supposedly some discharged material from a UFO. And I wonder if it had any resemblance to something like this. I came across a person who says they were there as maybe far back as 15 years ago who uh, got to find someone that lived in Aurora who showed them some of the metal which did have hieroglyphics. It was smooth on one side and rough on another. Made me think about this and it could be around in someone's attic in a box somewhere. There could be some of this metal still out there. Now I'll run through this next part pretty quickly but of course the newspapers say that the inhabitant was not of this world. It's buried in the local cemetery in Aurora which you can go to. It was originally a Masonic cemetery so not everyone was buried there. It's right here under this tree and across is a house that I talked to the people there and someone said they have dreams about a small alien. I thought that was interesting. The original headstone seemed to actually be half of maybe a, another stone, which if you can look at, seems it could have been extrapolated to show a full craft. So that was there and of course the newspapers show when it was stolen 
back in the 70s after Jim Mars and some others got to publicize the whole thing again where they did metal detector readings and then after that it seemed to be stolen. More recently the History Channel went out and did some readings and ground penetrating radar over the site which they showed did contain a small child sized grave so that's interesting. They also removed the well house of the well and showed that it did see that uh, it did seem that there was some strange metal that was found to be of molten aluminum with some unknown elements and they sent Pat Uskert of UFO hunters down the well where they didn't really find much. High concentrations, uh, concentrations of aluminum but they found a snake that they just you know let go. I thought it would have been interesting if they kept that and maybe did some studies. They found some bits of metal embedded in the trees and rocks so there does seem to be something that shows how there is a lot that happened. The Dallas Morning News reported that someone or something was in the craft. The pilot of the ship is supposed to have been the only one on board, and while his remains were badly disfigured, enough of the original has been picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. Mr. T.J. Weems, the United States Army Signal Services officer at this place, and an authority on astronomy, gives it as his opinion that the pilot was a native of the planet Mars. His description was that it was an alien in form, and he was referred to as a Martian. Now, the only reference to Martians at that time were in the drawings of the science fiction writers, so it could have been sparked in part by literature. Of course, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure who piloted the craft. All I can go is by the newspaper accounts, and they made it quite clear that uh, the remains clearly indicated he was not an inhabitant of this world. According to the Fort Worth Register, the alien did not survive. They reported that he was given a Christian burial in the town cemetery. So it's interesting that they showed that they gave this creature, or whatever it may have been, a formal Christian burial, which is unusual, I think, in some aspects. But after the first marker was stolen, another was put in place, which is down here. This was also stolen, and so they came a few years ago and put this large one here, which is now the current marker. It's a much larger stone. I don't think anyone's going to go walk off with that one. Um, for anyone that's followed up with UFO reports and things like that, you might be familiar with the Battle of L.A., which prompted uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, George Marshall, to write to FDR saying that after they had their investigation of L.A., their intelligence groups basically determined that the mystery planes are in fact not earthly and they are in all probability of interplanetary origin and they need to research more. They also says they need to find all the War Department files on unconventional area phenomena since 1897. So that's interesting that they reported this. Not to mention this says this is a file, top secret file from the interplanetary phenomenon unit. FDR writes back saying, I've considered this. I don't think we should share it with the Russians. I'll have Dr. Bush proceed with the project without further delay and that the Army will have all the fruits of the research and the applications of this new wonder. So that's interesting. Of course, they came out with a movie in 86, The Aurora Encounter. As amazing as it seems, what you are about to see is true. What the people of Aurora, Texas saw. What in the world was it? Where in the world does it come from? And why in the world did it choose Aurora, Texas for its first out-of-this-world encounter? Aurora Encounter. A true story. Believe it or not. Aurora Encounter. Ready, PG. Basically, the changes in the movie were that the spaceman doesn't die in the crash and he interacts with the people. The airship looks a lot different. And at the end, um, they changed the ending. I think they tried to capitalize on the success of E.T. And it was a low-budget film, mostly with local actors. Um, they were criticized for using Mickey Hayes, who had progeria. But it was his wish to be in a Hollywood movie, and he passed away not long after that. So this gets us to the real Aurora Alien Encounter which we held the first one last year. I got into touch with Dr. Tony Wheeler, the city administrator for Aurora, and we talked about the possibility of having an event. And so she was all for it, and the city was on board. I got together with Jim Mars, and after meeting all together with uh, the city and uh, getting in touch with Richard Ray of Fox 4, we did some promotional work to get ready for the first ever Aurora Alien Encounter, 
which was last year. We had a number of speakers, including Jim Mars, of course, Tui Snyder, Nick Redfern, and others, including Travis Walton. Great turnout, lots of alien stuff to look at, big bounce house for the kids, big buffet. We had other authors like Noe Torres and Steven Androsco. Tui Snyder spoke on the airship mystery. We had Travis Walton as the keynote who talked on his experience with fire in the sky and shuttle tours to the crash site and cemetery. It was a lot of fun to be able to go to the crash site with a group of people and to look at the cemetery and the grave with a, a city tour guide and just to see these uh, places and explore this historical value. All of the videos from the conference can be found on our YouTube page, and so this is something that, if you're interested in, you can connect with. They also had the Aurora Alien Abduction House, uh, and that gets us to this year's 120th anniversary of the Aurora Alien Encounter. That's gonna be on Saturday, April the 22nd, which is a little over a month away. It's going to be at MD Resort in Aurora, Texas. So it's gonna be a day event. It's gonna be a great time. I definitely recommend, for anyone that's interested, to check it out. Tickets are on sale now. They're uh, going to be erecting a new monument. It kind of looks like they crashed again. I want to say that they crashed again this year, but really they're putting something together to unveil for the event. We're going to have a lot of great speakers. Jim Mars, Nick Redfern, Toei, uh, Tui Snyder, Noe Torres, J Jerry Cooper, Melanie Young with the Star Child Skull, and of course our keynote speaker, David Hatcher Childress of Ancient Aliens. Great schedule, full of events. Guys, I want to thank you for your time. Please come to the table if you're interested in anything that's going on with Aurora. Tickets are on sale now, and it'd be great to have you come out, and look forward to coming and talking with each of you guys later. Thanks.